Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. End of March here at the homestead. I am chopping wood and carrying sap, boiling it down, and we are putting out this episode with Dana O'Driscoll. She's coming back to the show. We had her in one of our earliest episodes, and she's a wonderful artist, druid, animist magician, and we get to talk about some really wonderful things in this episode. We talk about all the ways that you can help heal the land, about her new book. We get into specifics of making refugia gardens. There's just so much good stuff in here. And we go into a discussion about different banishing rituals, the sphere of protection, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, and we get a little nerdy, so I hope you enjoy that too. Before we get to the show, I want to just remind folks that I am available for Vedic Astrology readings. You can book one for donation by emailing me at info at And then if you would like to get a early bird ticket to the Plant Cunning Conference, which will be at our small farm and homestead uh, on the last weekend of July, and where we will have some fantastic speakers such as Pam Montgomery, Seven Song, Rebecca Beyer, Zamboni Funk, Lisa Fazio, and many more, then go to plantcunningconference.com to get your tickets. We'll have early bird tickets until the first week of May, so get them before then. Okay, here we go. Dana O. Driscoll and Healing the Land. Today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have Dana O. Driscoll returning, and Dana is a fantastic artist, herbalist, druid. In fact, she's the head of the Ancient Order of Druids in America, and she's written some wonderful books, including the new Land Healing and I'm really excited about this book. I think it's a fantastic book, and I'm I'm glad that you've put it out. So how are you today? I'm all right. Thank you for asking. Here in Western Pennsylvania, our trees are running, and the maple sap is welling up from the ground. And, you know, I just always find this time of year to be extremely inspirational. It's sort of like the when you're planting the seed, and right when the seed starts to sprout, there's that, there's that just sense of like, wow, what is this going to turn into? So I think there's a lot of that energy right now. Yeah, for sure. It's a very, there's a lot of potentials and and what what will manifest has yet to be Mm. known, but it's also like a, it's like the hungry gap time too, you know, Mm -hmm. like you're getting motivated to to, to get on projects and, and starting to wake up from the winter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this book that you've, that you're putting out land healing, let me get the full, what is the full title here? Land healing. Physical, metaphysical, and ritual practices for healing the earth. Yes. That's great. Oh, beautiful. You did the art on the cover. I did. Yeah, actually, I brought, I have the art. So, <gasps> oh, gorgeous. So, wow. so beautiful. A few of the pieces of the art here today. Awesome. Yeah. So we want to dive into talking about the book and your work in general, but I also wanted to acknowledge the recent loss of one of your mentor teachers, Sarah Greer. So I read your article about her and her um, husband, John Michael Greer's article about her. And it was really cool to learn a little bit about her life. And I just wanted to say that our our hearts are with you as you're dealing with the loss of this mentor and powerful woman. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah's Sarah's very quiet and all the things she did, but she was very important. And I think that's part of why I think both John Michael and I felt the need to sort of share and, you know, and and I think, you know, being able to carry on some of her teachings and some of her legacy, you know, that's really important. It's really important work. So um, thank you for that acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm so glad to hear that you have a rose in your garden that every time you, you know, enjoy the smells of it and make medicine from it, you'll be able to keep a little bit of piece of Sarah alive. And I think that's so special how plants can offer us the, that really powerful reminder so Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and of course they spread and as they spread then we spread them so there is that Mm -hmm. sort of that idea of that spreading that medicine and spreading these teachings yeah Mm -hmm. yes wonderful so this book seems to be kind of a culmination of a lot of your 
life work as like, a <laughs> druid and healer and herbalist and teacher teaching other people how to connect with the land. So what brought about the inspiration to actually get these words on paper this time around? Yeah, I feel like I've actually been writing this book my whole life. And I, I feel like that too. Yeah. <laughs> sort of in many ways, I feel like it is my life's work. And now that it's out, I'm just like, I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> um, I mean, I do, but you know, yeah, I think that, I think for me, it was growing up where I grew up. And then also, you know, so I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. I mean, there's lots of reasons I'm back here, but I did feel that strong need to reconnect with the land and work with the land. And in in the in the methods, many of the methods described in the book, and of course, many methods that I did not describe in the book that are more my personal methods. And, you know, I was actually writing this book concurrently with Sacred Action. So I was writing, I, I take really long time to write things. I have to sort of do every ritual multiple times and really think about it, share it on the blog, hear what people have to say. So it's like, I don't write these things very quickly. This is why I don't really produce, like, I produce a lot of work in my blog, but books wise, you know, I'm only producing one every couple of years coming out. And I think that's because there's just, you know, there's just a care and attention to that. But, you know, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and had just all of these experiences. And, you know, we're really in an extraction zone here. There's just because of fossil fuels, you know, originally, you know, I think about all my, my own ancestors. It was logging. It was coal mines, steel mills. And, you know, the entire landscape, I mean, we have almost no old growth forests. And now we have a lot of second growth, regrowth forests. But then after that, you know, it was like, so the, the, the steel mills came and the coal mines came and then the fracking came and then the mountaintop removal came. And, you know, we're dealing with just so many layers of complexity. We just had the worst coal-fired power plants in the, in the nation in terms of pollution shut down this summer. Yay. Finally, you know, and you, the acidic streams that have no life. So, you know, sort of like when you are in this place that's extremely beautiful and that you have these beautiful spiritual connections, but on the other side of that, you also see the damage that is done. And I just recently had a, a person that moved here that's become a good friend of mine. And she was just like, and she had never been here before she moved here. And she was just like, what is with the people in the land? And I was like, <laughs> oh, let me tell you about that. So I do think that this particular area, people are so used to extracting resources from the land that there was just such a need for healing. And so I did that work when I lived here when I was younger. I learned a lot of that living in other places. Like I lived in Southeast Michigan for six years and we were dealing with like the big tar sands pipeline, the one everybody fights mm -hmm. over, line 6B. Mm -hmm. That was coming through pretty close to where I lived. It was actually coming through Deanne Bednar's Strawbale Studio, which was just where I was learning natural building and a lot of sustainable living. And sort of how do we deal with that energetically? She invited me over to, you know, do ceremonies for the land. And so as I was learning sort of herbalism and sort of outer herbalism, right? And as I was learning permaculture and I was learning regenerative le living, also sort of saying, well, what, there's a lot of times like the, the, the pipeline is a good example, right? So we have this line, it's going to destroy you know, miles and miles of ecosystems. It's coming right through the like the middle of this sacred sanctuary that we're all learning sustainable living. So, you know, oftentimes there's things we can't physically do. So we do. And that's when I'm like, do ceremony. Mm. I can't control the fact that there is a beautiful mountain being removed. That's literally like five miles from my house. And every time I go past that mountain, I cry. But yeah. if the only thing I do is cry, there seems like there's a possibility to do more, right? So what happened is a sort of in this sort of like this landscape of all of this damage, like everywhere you look, it's damage. So I started using the Druid frameworks that I was already learning, using magical frameworks and studying different ways that people interacted with the land and healed the land. You know, looking at things like wassailing is a really ancient tradition for land blessing that actually has a lot of good magical frameworks in it that teaches us how to help bless the land so then we can have abundance, right? And trying these things out for a really long time where I lived. And then anytime I went somewhere, trying them out there. And eventually the book was born. But it was really born out of a need to do what I can, do whatever I can. And realizing that I am one human being. But if I write this book, and I'm also developing a, a land healers network associated with the book with like regular Zoom calls and rituals and other things. So like creating a network of people, then suddenly me as just one person, now there's a group of us and then now we're shifting the paradigm, right? So that was really the impetus for, for putting this out in this way. That's really cool. Will you send us info about that group too? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. I think that's true that like only, 
or one person can only do so much, but we do also have a lot of power in what we do, especially uh, with your distinction between like the physical and the metaphysical. You've talked about how the metaphysical can really amplify what work you're doing in the physical because as above, so below. And yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about the distinction in like broad terms between metaphysical and physical work? Sure. Yeah. So I think when we think about any kind of healing work there, you know, and I mean, we know this as herbalists, right? Like there is a, there is, there is a human body, there is a, a physical heart, but there is also a spirit. There is also an emotional heart and really, you know, obviously Western paradigms and Western traditions, allopathic medicine, you know, every, every, every scientist in the world, you name it, like really only recognizes that there is a physical reality. And so, and when it comes to land healing, that physical reality is important. Species yeah, yeah. go extinct when, when we don't protect them, when ecosystems are lost. So recognizing that that physical reality, you know, that we need to attend it if we can. So, you know, I live on five acres. I have a lot of opportunity to do healing. So the physical healing would be things like rewilding, replanting, using permaculture to design ecosystems that support life. In the book, I share a concept of refugia, which we can talk about further, which was actually introduced to me by John Michael Greer. And then, so that's sort of like physical healing, like let us replant the earth, let us let us nurture and nourish what exists of all life. But, you know, going back to some of the earlier stories I was talking about, the other challenge of this is that sometimes we don't have that power. Maybe we live in a city and we can help with a local conservation organization, but we don't actually own any land or we're renters or we are, you know, moving around a lot or mm. you know, we have a disability, we can't get outside. So there's a lot of reasons that people may want to be able to take up that physical land healing and, you know, get a permaculture design certificate, grow a big abundant herb garden, you know, water seeds, whatever. But every person on this planet can do the second set of the activities, the metaphysical activities. And sometimes that's just like witnessing and holding space as a forest is being cut down, or that is getting a group of your friends together to offer healing and blessing to the land because that nourishes the land, that nourishes the spirits. Mm. And just sort of learning how to be a good human, paying attention and saying, I'm not willing to look away. And in doing so, recognizing the healing power of nature and deepening that connection, you know, whether or not you're practicing herbalism or you are, you know, an accountant, it doesn't really matter, right? But every one of us can do that. So that sort of distinction to me is really saying that there is both, you know, as above, so below, right? There is a physical reality and we should, if we have the capacity, heal as much as we can and protect as much as we can, because these next couple of decades are really going to matter in terms of what survives. And that's, and so I have chapters in the book that really address that, but also in some cases, this problem is so big that it does get overwhelming. And then we're like, yeah. well, what, what can we, what can we do? Like, you know, it's like, if all I wanted to do is just work my local ecosystem, I'm still overwhelmed, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, that's true. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, what can we do? So this is where ceremonial approaches can come in and allow us to do something regardless of what we physically can or can't do. Yeah. And I, in the book also, you, you talk about the different levels, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, and this comes from like a, an occult cosmology, I guess, the cult philosophy, esoteric philosophy, where there, there are different planes, you know, and there, the physical plane is, is just one plane. And yeah. it, in, in the materialist Western industrialist perspective, it's the only plane, but in fact, the material plane is downstream from the, the more subtle planes. Do you think you could just talk a little bit about like that? framework and how that helps influence yeah. what, what kind of ceremonies you do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the most important things to understand about this is that like we, ma magic is the direction of the human will, right? So we will it in order to be, to exist, right? And we can look actually like science fiction is actually a really good example of this. People had ideas about things like robots and AI long before they actually manifested in reality. You know, Isaac Asimov was writing about robots in the 1960s. He put that vision into the world. And then 40 years later, now we have a robot, which is named Asimo, right? right. So, if we think about, so if we think about this on sort of this larger scale, I think what a lot of human beings are trying to do right here, and certainly the two of you running this podcast and all the work you're doing with the conference and everything are part of that is that. I think a lot of us are saying we need a better vision and how do we get that? And part, the first step of that vision is doing the magic. It's laying the energetic foundations. It's saying, okay, we are rejecting this materialistic industrial 
concepts and the, this you know paradigm, this worldview, because it's killing everything. And we're looking for something that is that is holistic and healed. And that perspective, that particular paradigm, we're all trying to bring it in. Mm. That paradigm recognizes that there are physical and metaphysical realities and the idea that we are directing our will and our vision to that. So that is, I mean, that is sort of esoteric philosophy 101. Like if you want to work yeah. magic, you have to believe that planes of existence exist that aren't. A lot of what I work with in the book uses an animistic framework. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the world as not a disenchanted place, mm -hmm. but an enchanted place full of spirits. So yeah. a lot of the metaphysical work would be on what we would consider to be the etheric plane, although there is some astral work in there as well. So the, the plane of spirit that sort of is directly overlaying our own. So if I speak to say my best friend, lemon scented geranium, which is up in the window right here, I see lemon scented geranium, but then I also can connect directly with lemon scented geranium and speak with her and we can have a nice conversation. Yeah. And then I say to lemon scented geranium, Hey, do you need anything today? Can I help you? And she's like, no, I'm good. Okay. We're good. Right. <laughs> so, so, so a lot of this is like recognizing that there, the world is full of spirits and everything has a spirit and honoring the sovereignty of those spirits and letting them be the guides as to the best kinds of healing. So that's sort of like in a very basic way, the nut in a nutshell. There are different kinds of healing I talk about as well. Mm. Yeah, I saw on your Instagram page, Druid's Garden, a tree that you created showing the different branches of the metaphysical and and physical. At at the roots, the physical, we've got prevention, and that's for fostering human and land connections. And I was wondering. I kind of want to get into some of some yeah. questions about these different things, but we've got prevention, sure. physical land healing and self-care for the physical. So as far as prevention, I'm thinking of like examples of like working with the youth or like having your friends over to do a sailing, like to foster this love for the earth, working with an anti-fracking organization, fit like things like yeah. that. So yes. do you have any other examples for prevention? Yeah, I think prevention is any time that we are working to cultivate different. So, so thinking about these paradigms we're talking about, right? So many, you know, so I'll, I'll give a good example. I give plant walks in my community. I give probably like five to seven free plant walks a year. Cool. And I know folks want to go out and they want to harvest food and medicine. And, but I can do it in a way that is preventative in the sense that they're going to go out and harvest regardless, right? But if I can provide a framework of care, and nurturing. I can teach them what they would consider to be. I have the problem with the term invasive, but I'll use it for, sure. I can teach them to harvest all the autumn olive they want, mm -hmm. but I don't actually teach them the ginseng and the ramps and other things. Yeah, so right. in that case, what I'm doing is I'm teaching people a framework of care and hopefully, and, and what's been great about that is that people learn how to harvest from their lawn and now, now they're not spraying it. So that's, I think, a nice work of sort of thinking about like, how do we foster these larger human land connections? How do we get more people to recognize that the land is sacred? I mean, I'm not going to ask them to believe that the lawn is full of spirits. That's probably too much for people in Western Pennsylvania. We're in a pretty conservative area. But can I at least get them to think about their own role in being a member of the community of the earth, that they're not just a human being picking things that have no value, but, you know, so even like to me, the first part is care and value. And then we kind of go from there. So different people do this in lots of different ways. I think, you know, AC, you gave a whole bunch of examples, you know, I work with the UU kids. Sometimes I teach them herbalism, you know, it's sort of just like reaching people where they're at to help them understand that the land is valuable and that we should care for it. And, you know, those sorts of things. Definitely. Yeah. Makes sense. So then next we have the physical land healing. So this is different than the energetic land healing, which we can get into, but the physical land healing, I'm thinking of more like regenerative agriculture, healing mm -hmm. soils, like yeah. clean, up. clean up. Yeah. Picking up yeah. trash. Like, yeah. is that basically yeah. the direction? Yeah. Going? So I'll give you, I have one of my, my, let's see if actually, I can't even pick this whole thing up at once. So <laughs> this is the land healing. We think about soil and seeds, right? So here oh. are American hazelnuts, one of the understory trees that have a hard time coming back after logging. And I also have Lindera. I have spice bush berries oh, here. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, and I also have a hickory and there's a little bit of hawthorn in here. And these have been sitting on my porch, cold stratifying all winter. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about land healing, one of the things I think about is scattering seeds. In my in my case, in my in my ecosystem, when we think about physical land healing, there's sort of the, lay, the work you can do on your own land, which would be 
permaculture, you know, gardening, and I have a couple of examples I can share, but it's also sort of how do I tend this broader landscape where there is nobody tending this landscape? How do I, you know, so these seeds I just showed you, I'm actually doing a couple of workshops this year and I'm going to be passing them out and I encourage people to go out and, and spread them. These are all plants that have a hard time regenerating when there's been a lot of damage. And then we end up with other species that might outcompete, especially like hazel or spice bush. So, oh, yeah. you know, honeysuckle there instead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or multiflora, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Barberry, multiflora, honeysuckle would be replacing some of these. So I think that when we think about that, what I do in the book is I sort of break down like understanding your ecosystem. What are the pieces you have to understand? How you have to understand a healthy ecosystem to understand, oh, I want to scatter seeds. I want to do this one rewilding kind of thing, right? So there's that whole piece of that, which I think even if you are not, you don't have land. But if you're going out and you're doing wild food foraging or herbalism, like you could add this whole regenerative practice where I'm gathering seeds, I'm scattering them. A lot of us do that, but we don't necessarily think about that as magic. We don't think about that as healing as, you know, so thinking about that as reciprocation. And so what I like to, another part of the, the book that I talk a lot about is this idea of refugia or refugia. Mm, yeah. And so what when we go back to looking at the last ice age, one of the things that was present in the ice age, when you know humans made it through the last ice age, we basically lived on the, in the edges of the Mediterranean Sea on cliffs. And then we also know that other things survived in the ice age. Whenever there were a, there was maybe there was a high point where the glaciers went around, or there was like a a, a place where you know there was some sort of shelter. And mm -hmm. then whenever <laughs> that ice age ended, those were the places that all life came back. And if you think about today, you know, we have, I don't know, 50,000, 50 million acres of lawns that are being sprayed with pesticides in North America. We have at least that as much in cultivation of conventional agriculture. So when we think about the inhospitable locations for life right now and how much we've, you know, how, how that's part of why we have so much extinction and in, in endangered species right now is because there is less and less space for life that's not humans to live. And so the idea of refugia is that you identify core species in your ecosystem that would, that could use a place to live that is safe. And then from there you cultivate that. And most of the time this is insects or species, and then you work magic there. Mm -hmm. And then you start gathering your seeds. So these all come from my refugia, right? Then you start scattering your seeds, blessing your seeds, interweaving the physical and the metaphysical. So when I give these seeds out, these seeds have all received energetic blessings. So when they're going out, they're spreading that. And what's so interesting about the concept of refugia and like they're starting to talk about climate refugia. So this yeah, is yeah. starting to catch on in other places mm. is that it might be that you're the person that's keeping a species afloat in your entire county. And so it's like, actually, when we think about how powerless we all feel, with a lot of what's going on in the world, refugia is a very empowering practice because suddenly you're actually, this is a practice, like if there's enough people that create refugia, we actually could make a substantial difference because we can support that life that really needs places to live. So that's to me, is just so empowering. Um, So physical empowering. and healing. I talk about that. I talk about like lawn, like, you know, taking over your lawn, do a permaculture in your lawn, you know, all those all those sorts of things. So sort of offering these different approaches that that you can take. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there, you know. Yeah. I, I love the idea of refugia and like I, I've been kind of doing that too. And it's especially looking at things in terms of the climate refugia as well, because like we don't know exactly how this is gonna go, but it seems like things are gonna be warmer where we, you know, this winter has been the warmest winter ever yeah. here. So there are plants that like pawpaw, persimmon, chickasaw plum all these species that are native like 500 yeah. miles south of here or like, like where i'm at yeah 100 miles yeah. south of of mm -hmm. here but they they want to be here and also we have a lot of species dying like all of our ash are now dying so there's going to be big changes and we want we want there to be refugia where they can these species can then come mm -hmm. out from and and re repopulate and or newly populate because maybe they were not going to survive in florida or georgia or yeah. south carolina anymore but they'll start going into new york and vermont mm -hmm. and so on canada yeah. but the other thing I, that I, i'm noticing about this too is is i'm seeing this happening with the the native plants 
people are getting really excited about this. And there's there's starting to be these native plant the little areas in people's lawns in the suburbs. Mm-hmm. And it's like that's that's a great like that those are those in refugia and then those will spawn out mm-hmm. new new populations. Even though sometimes, you know, they can be from well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I get you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I, I think that like taking this idea and spreading it. And listen, I want everybody to spread this. I don't care if you call it, whatever you call it. I don't care as long yeah. as you do it, right? Yeah. But if enough of us start really thinking in this way, because you know, there are these sort of dominant narratives of powerlessness. Mm-hmm. And I know you recently talked to Ben Falk and you know his big thing I love that he says is like, you know, the idea that you are a force of good. Yeah. There's so many ideas that you're the force, like that all the, like the narratives that we are told is that we as humans are bad. And it's better if we didn't live. These are his words, right? Mm -hmm. But I really think that he's right. And instead we can say, actually, no, we are a force of healing and good. And it's an orientation. And so even doing something as simple as ripping out 10 square feet of your lawn and putting in a pollinator habitat, and maybe these are native seeds, and maybe you've got things like New England aster and milkweed that actually have a hard time continuing to propagate because of all the mowing and spraying so Mm -hmm. now suddenly you're not only a force of good in those 10 square feet but you're making seed balls you're you're giving them to children oh wow suddenly like (laughs) suddenly like and of course you're doing all this magical work on top of it to bless them and like suddenly you're doing a lot and that's cool and 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 you know it really gives you a sense of like purpose it gives you you know you stop feeling bad about how terrible the world is. And you're starting to say, no, I could just do a little bit more, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I I think that these, these, you know, when I teach these concepts, they're really exciting for people to learn because of that. Yeah, totally. I think that brings us right into the third root of your physical explanation for, for healing. And that's self-care for mm-hmm. grounding protection and peace. And yeah. it's also self-love, right? Like of not yeah. seeing ourselves as a force of of bad, but seeing ourselves as a force of good. So what are some of the, the ways that folks can practice self-care? Yeah. So self-care is the final chapter in the book. And I was really committed to including it because I think that if all the book is like, is go out, do, 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 yeah. you know, we all are dealing with this. We're all dealing with this climate crisis, you know, yeah. and, you know, seeing the skies blacken with smoke last summer, like that was, you know, yeah. how much trauma do people have from that experience or experiencing yeah. these extreme weather conditions, even just experiencing sort of the powerlessness and grief of what is happening to our world. And then being at land healer and going out, okay, the forest is being cut. I'm going to witness that. I'm going to walk in that space after that forest has been cut down and I'm going to provide healing. But in the end, if you are too damaged to do that healing, you cannot heal, right? So really thinking about this in terms of herbal, you know, a lot of herbal, I got a lot of herbalism in that chapter, herbal supports, um, retreats, meditations, ways of caring for ourselves and nurturing ourselves and allowing the land to heal us in return. So seeing, seeing healing is a really reciprocal thing where, you know, as a healer, maybe you're healing other people and then, you know, they're your friends, they heal you back, but also how do we heal that land? And in exchange, and then you just, because that's what's not even exchange, just as that reciprocal thing Mm -hmm. that keeps, that keeps, keeps cycling. So as we heal the land, the land heals us. And then we all have the ability to do more, you know, and, and, you know, and I think that's really important. So I wanted to include that because I worry that without that, people can burn themselves out. And Mm -hmm. we also get into things like, you know, Chiron, the wounded healer, and thinking about sometimes the best healers are those that have that, you know, like understand loss, right? So I think that that's an important part. Yeah, really important part. Yeah, I'm glad that you included that in, in the book. For sure. So then for the metaphysical, the branches of your tree, we have uh, land blessing, energetic land healing and palliative care. So about the land blessing for growth, fertility and abundance. Do you have yeah. some examples of, of what you do? Yeah, sure. So land blessing. So if we look at ancient cultures, look at ancient human cultures, many, many cultures used to do all kinds of ceremonies to support the land and the fertility. And I think that my own philosophy of this is that the land evolved to have that as part of the land's nourishment. And of course, with my, with our sort of modern industrial culture, you know, rather than 
nourishing the land through ceremonies. You know, we pretend that that, that entire thing doesn't exist. So I briefly mentioned the wassailing ceremonies as one nice example, which is always fun because they're not like overtly like pagan -y, you know what I mean? Like you can invite like everyday people to do a, an orchard wassail. And I actually took the concept of orchard wassailing and then spread it more broadly to show how you can use this idea of say, okay, you have a piece, you know, you've got a mountain and you know, you'd like to give this mountain healing choose the oldest tree on that mountain. And then you use various kinds of energy raising, whether that's working with the, I offer a seven element framework, which is actually AODA's framework, bringing in the different elements. You can do chanting magic. You can do setting standing stone, which brings down the, the light of the, of the solar current. So there's sort of lots of ways to do that. How we do that here, we've actually been building a stone circle and doing a lot of sort of radiating energy and light out from that as a way of healing and blessing. And we do wassailing ceremonies. And then, I mean, we have so many things. We have, yeah. <laughs> altars in the garden, a regular, yeah. just, just, I mean, honestly, even such something as simple as a regular offering and a gratitude practice to plants, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. thank you. I'm, I'm going to sing to you when we go out to tap our maple trees. I sing to the maples every morning. You do not want me to sing for you. I'm not that great at singing. <laughs> but the trees don't mind. <laughs> but the trees don't mind. And I have a maple song that I sing every to every tree every time I come. And when we tap, before we tap the trees, we give them a blessing and we ask their permission. So it's, I do it's want just... to hear that song though. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. I'm just saying. I, I can give you the lyrics. It's actually designed to the, the sound of Edelweiss. Okay. So, sound of music and maple tree. Ma okay, I'll do it. Maple tree every morning. I, I guess, sorry. Now I'm going to sing. I got to give myself a moment. Okay. Yes. <laughs> maple tree, maple tree. Every morning I greet thee. Strong and wise reach the heights. You look happy to meet me. Flowing in snow, may you bloom and grow, bloom and grow forever. Maple tree, maple tree, bless this dear friend forever. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thank you, I just wrote that song. And, you know, if I'm going to be asking for this, if I'm going to be asking for the maple sap, I want to be reciprocating energetically, physically, and giving them blessings so that they are nourished. So as they're nourishing me, I am nourishing them. And to me, that's kind of like living on the living on the earth as a human being 101. Like, yeah. you know, like <laughs> this is the stuff that we've lost, but this is the stuff that if we want nurturing civil human civilizations, this is the stuff we've got to find again. So to me, that's like, you know, doing that kind of basic basic ritual work and magical work and honoring and reverence and respect that's necessary if we're going to do any of these other things totally yes yeah absolutely yeah i think it's important to remember that reciprocal relationship and incorporating song and music and dance is like such a age old way of showing that gratitude you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of crazy to not sing when you're planting seeds or you know yeah, but you know, like, you know, we're talking about shifting a whole paradigm and worldview and, you yeah. know, and, you know, for somebody like me, you know, I'm just a typical white person who grew up not even understanding the history and legacy of colonialization. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can trace my family, my mother's side back here to like the founding of Pennsylvania, like before the founding of Pennsylvania, which means that my ancestors were directly responsible for a lot of killing and pillaging, yeah. and stealing, right? And that is something that I never grew up even thinking about, even though I think my family, we had a garden, we had herbs, but we never thought about the need to recognize the land as a, like a spirit and recognize, you know, that we needed to nourish the land in that way. Like we took care of it. We had compost, but there was that piece that was missing. And so this is a piece, I think a lot of us, at least with that kind of heritage, we have to relearn and we have to make it very intentional. And you know, and even I've been doing these practices for 20 years, but I feel like I still sometimes forget. Oh, yeah. I need to go get some calendula, go out to the garden, get my calendula, run back in. I'm like, oh, I forgot. Thank you. You know, so even like run back out. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and that's why I do the regular ceremonies, right? You know, so, mm -hmm. hey, land, I'm giving you this giant blessing. And if I forget in my hurry in the moment, just thank you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's the really important thing about regular ritual because it really st structures time and 
you not forget <laughs> because it's so it is really so easy, especially when you're doing gardening and farm work, when you're like, you get caught up in the moment, you know, and you're angry at the weeds and you're, you know, just, but the structuring time element have making sure that these ceremonies are regular, really makes sure they happen mm-hmm. for one. And then keep, cause it keeps it in your consciousness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. I feel like so, we're all just like relearning, like it's exactly yeah. it. It's just a relearning. It's a reorientation and it's a lifetime of work and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Remembering. Mm-hmm. Putting yeah. into practice. Mm-hmm. Is there, there's not that, you know, what are the, what, what, from the Dion fortune, it's a, it's a track in space. Oh, right. There the aren't tracks in space for, for, yeah. for this right now. And so by doing these rituals ourselves and, and propagating them and, but even just doing them, Mm-hmm. creates tracks in space on a more subtle level which makes it easier for more people mm-hmm. in our culture to do yeah and the more yeah. that you do the same ritual in the same space over time you're also developing those tracks so then once mm-hmm. it builds right and that's why you know when you go to places where there have been ceremonies done for a long period of time that's why it feels so different right so it's like not only is that land awake and alive but those tracks are there and that's they're true pregnant those because those rituals have been and so that's another thing is like the every time you do it you're adding to it Uh uh-huh yeah so about how to energetically heal the land you you say in that tree diagram energetic land healing for sites that are ready for healing and growth which brings up a question of are some places not ready yeah and this is something that I sort of feel like I had to learn the hard way. Okay. Um, and I use the metaphor of a sick person to describe this. So on the land, we have places that are actively being harmed. I point to the mountain that is being removed down the road from me, right? This is not a place that I want to like go, hey, let's inject a bunch of positive energy into this place because this is a place that's actively suffering. And in fact, sort of raising a bunch of energy almost sort of would probably cause more harm, right? So I think that a lot of people who do, you know, ceremonies and rituals and maybe lean like neo-pagan or druid are like, yeah, I'm going to raise energy and I'm going to direct it, right? And there's that sort of like the one of the one of the sort of big things we do. But the problem with that is, you know, from a from a land healing perspective is that sometimes sometimes things need to rest. You know, sometimes an animal does not want you to provide a ton of healing. That animal wants to die. And so to me, a big, big, big way of understanding this is, are there, do you want to be performing what we would consider to be palliative care in the sense that there's a very sick person, they need rest, they need a quiet environment. Maybe they just need somebody to sit by their bed and less listen to them. Land is a lot like that, where there are these sites that are just really, you know, you think about our super fun sites, thinking about sites that, you know, there's active harm being caused by humans, you know, the spirits of the land in those cases often are in pain. And so that palliative care is a really different perspective than say, when I am, when I walk into a forest that's recently been logged and I say, okay, forest, you're probably not going to be logged again for, for 50 years. Let me raise some healing energy and support you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and that's uh, there was a, you had a story, a brief story in there too about listening to the the beings there right. and seeing what they want, and so asking the hemlock who has this woolly adalgin problem, you know, do you want is it more palliative or is it, do you want to, do you want energy to help fight this thing? And they were like, let's fight, and that's the that's the energy that I've gotten too from yeah. the, the hemlocks. They're like yeah. they're they're gonna, they're not going to just mm-hmm. be wiped out like the the chestnuts or the the ash around here they they they're, they're going to fight and we can help them so <laughs> yeah so in that case you know so in that case this gets into sort of this idea of like how do we listen carefully how do we before before we do anything because again this is something we have to untrain ourselves like re- relearn is okay nature is full of sovereign beings nature is full of spirit and i as a human do not know right what nature needs i do not know if i want to heal i need to respect the sovereignty i need to listen and maybe the i've definitely had a, a number of times where i've gone to a place you know we have a like a beautiful forest down the road that they just cut down and turned into a field and i've stopped there three times and i'm like hey i'm here do you need anything no go away no oh. go away and you know what the yeah. best thing that I can do is respect the sovereignty of the land. If the land says go away, I go away. I come back a couple months later and try again. And I've been doing that for about a year and a half. And someday maybe the land will say, actually, yeah, I'd like you to stay. 
Mm. But at that point, you know, if the hemlocks want to fight, let's let the hemlocks fight. But if the hemlocks want to die, then I'm going to honor that. So mm. really thinking about how do we honor the needs of these spirits on this land that have been starved, that have been ignored, you know, as, as sort of a decor, like, let's just like, because that's healing, right? Giving somebody the recognition that you are alive and you are a being, mm -hmm. you know, even in itself is so, so powerful. If we're thinking about this idea of relearning and remembering the relationships we used to have. And really all of this, everything we're talking about is all about cultivating healthy relationships and mm -hmm. cultivating sort of relationships that help us relearn our own role in the world as, as regenerators, as caring individuals, as, as sort of caretakers of the land. Because that's like that, you know, Tyson Yon Caporta talks about this in his sand talk. Like that was the original role of human beings. Mm -hmm. And part of why we're all in so much dis-ease, right? We're all so, I mean, everybody is miserable in this culture is because we have lost our connection to the earth and learning these things, learning how to listen and be present and honor and acknowledge, hey, and you are no better or worse than me. We are equals. Mm -hmm. um, that goes away with a lot of the practice of this book. So when you do get no from a place or tree spirit or plant spirit, land spirit, do you have any things that can help build trust between you and the land spirit, like offerings or songs? Like what, what do you do? I mean, I think what you said about just respecting the no and leaving is kind of, you know, a number one, like first step. But if you are going back and you're bringing something, are there specific things that kind of win, win some of these people over? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a, I have a whole chapter on the tools of a land healer. Uh, so I actually have, I have a few tools here I can share. Sweet. So um, these, I, I bake these in the oven to prevent any, um, any issues. So like these are the, there's a lot of different sigils that are in the book that you can use. Are I mean, the these are hickory, these are hickory, shagons, hickory shells. So I showed oh. you the nuts. These are the shells. And then I bake them, I bake them in the oven at 400 for 10 minutes, just to make sure there was nothing left. If, Cause if I'm going to move them around, if I'm mm -hmm. staying in my ecosystem, it's not as important, but if I'm going somewhere else, it is. And I don't want to leave mm -hmm. these anywhere that are out of my ecosystem. So, so yeah. So one of the things you can do is create yourself what we call a clean bag, right? And that comes from the Druid tradition. There's a lot of, and I actually, this is one of the ones that I use is I have this little thing and it looks like a coin purse. Mm -hmm. And so when I go out into the world, like let's say there's actually, there is, this is actually what's going to happen this week. My camp has cut down what looked to me to be a perfectly good tree and I'm not happy about it. And the tree's not happy about it either, but we're in a circumstance where I can't like go there and do a half hour of ritual because it's literally in the middle of this campus walkway. And I happen to be a professional there. So I can take one of these, one of these sigils that I have blessed and enchanted, and then I can simply leave this very quietly at the base of the tree. And since it's in my coin purse that no one realizes is anything, you know, I, mm -hmm. I just discreetly pull this out of my purse, drop my sigil, and I'm on my way. And so there's a lot of a lot of techniques in the book that address the fact that a lot of times the healing that we need to do is not is, 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 is sort of needs to be visible. <laughs> There's a lot of people around to go to your specific question though. Cause I realized I didn't actually answer it. Yeah. Respecting the sovereignty is the, the first thing I like to come back pretty often. In that case, what I've been doing is I've been doing larger land blessings that would cover the whole area. Oh. And sometimes it's like, if you're just starting these things, nature has to understand that you're not just any other human. And mm -hmm. sometimes that takes time. So, you know, you get to know the most important thing you do is respect it. The last time I went over there a couple of, I went over there about a month ago and I just sort of sat, you know, by the space. I did not go into the space and I'm just like, Hey, is it okay if I sit here for a while? Yeah. Okay. Is it okay if I sing you a song? Yeah. Okay. Could I play my flute for you? Okay. So it's sort of like, you know, these in non-invasive approaches, right? Yeah. Can I leave you, can I leave you a blessing? No. Okay. Right. Oh. And, and, you know, and just, so this part of this is you have to really learn how to use either divination tools or your own body-based intuition and your own insights to actually be able to get the yeses and nos, right? Yeah. Ask the questions. But a lot of it's respect, you know, it's the same. It really, if you think about the spirits of the land, just like you would think about any person you don't know, there's a person in the city I'm walking by. I'm not just going to go up and be like, hey, and hug them and like, you know, pull at their hair, right? I'm going to yeah. actually respect them as a sovereign being. Same thing with the tree that was cut down. I see what happened to you. Can I help? Can I can I help your spirit pass? Can I spread the seeds that are still on the ground so that you have young ones that will come up? Like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. um, and and so, you know, there's, 
but yeah, in the end is, you know, we've got to respect the sovereignty of the land. And that is to me, like, if you're not doing that, then you're kind of missing the point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah totally. Great. Thank you for those tips. Yeah. yeah. So some of the, the rituals and ceremonies that you do, there's all, all sorts of levels, you know, there's like leaving the sigils, there's leaving tobacco or other things like that. And then there's, there's the wassailing and then there's the sphere of protection that do you tell us a little bit about the sphere of protection and like yeah. how you've, how you've worked it to be yeah. more focused on land blessing? Yeah. So the sphere of protection is one of the oldest parts of the AODA tradition. And at this point, we are pretty convinced it came from Dr. Juliet Ashley in the 1960s and then went through who was, she was probably the first female grand arch druid in AODA. And she headed up a whole bunch of different esoteric orders. And she was also really into union psychology, which is actually important here. Um, about 10 years ago, JMG did some research that actually looked at the relationship between union psychology and some of the ways that he talks about individuation and, and, and axio with the sphere of protection and found, oh, actually, these look like the same thing. So that's kind of where we think that's the current going story about where we think it came from. But people in AODA have been doing it for, you know, 50, 60 years. And I have found that it is a really effective really effective ritual practice. So I have built it into the book because a lot of my own work is rooted in AODA and like it works, right? So the basic sphere of protection is working with seven elements or seven directions. So the traditional four, everybody knows, earth, air, fire, water, that's pretty much the standard, right? But then the other thing that's really important for land healing and blessing is that we're also working with the telluric current, which is the um, deep currents of the earth. So that's sort of the core energy of the earth. We work with the solar current, which is the core energy of the sun, um, which 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 is very, very useful for blessings and pulling down that energy of the sun and bringing that. And then we work with the lunar current or sort of spirit within. So spirit above, spirit below, spirit within, which is the sort of the, there's different ways of understanding that one and different druids have different philosophies about it. But I really see it as sort of the entire spirit mapping, you know, the, the overlay of, of spirit in the world. And so what happens is then you essentially create this, you create this, you pull in all of these energies and then you create a sphere of whatever, right? And, you know, a sphere of energy, which then you can use for protecting yourself. Once you get good at it, you can protect whole mountain ranges with it. You know, you can use it, but, but you can really modify it to be for blessing for healing. And you can call different things in each of the quarters. So if I want, you know, I had a sick juniper outside, for example, and I was really hoping that this juniper would get well. And I did all the pruning. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to call upon healing energy. So I actually called upon different, uh, different plant energies with the sphere of protection, and then basically placed the sphere around the juniper. And then, you know what, my juniper is actually doing pretty good right now. So I feel really good about that. And wow. I did that a couple of times cool. with, of course, permission from the juniper. Mm -hmm. um, right. yeah. So what's, about the sphere of protection is that and john michael calls it like a swiss army knife and it really is it's very very flexible and it's very adaptable and once you learn it you can sort of use it for you could use it to enchant items you know you can use it to banish as well as to summon so it sort of becomes this extremely flexible ritual where the truth is if all i had as a land healer was that ritual i would be able to do a great deal of of work and so i built that ritual and i think it's a it's it's better than some other options. And I like the fact that it already has the tracks in space and it has the egregore behind it. Mm -hmm. And AODA as an order has been doing, we've been very committed to doing large scale earth healing rituals over the last two years that all use the sphere of protection. So we've got, you know, hundreds of people all over the world that are essentially doing spheres of protection at three times a year at the solstices and equinoxes. And then the fourth time a year is something different. But, you know, we've got a lot of people doing that. So it's working really well. So I'm like, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that, again, it's it's one of those things where each person can take it and adapt it to needs. And it's familiar enough for people that have done any kind of Western esoteric or wicca or you know there's like a lot of traditions that are already using at least a four or a five or a seven elemental system yeah i i've done several years of of sphere of protection and then also done other like lesser banishing ritual oh, okay. yeah yeah and there it, it, it there is a familiarity if you are familiar with the lesser banishing ritual then you'll know what's going on with the sphere of protection but the sphere of protection to me is just it's in a way it's a lot a lot gentler yeah 
and it's and it's more and it is so much more flexible whereas mm -hmm. like the the banishing ritual is very kind of aggressive in a certain way especially like I, i've been doing the heathen banishing ritual with petrogram with which is even more maybe aggressive <laughs> than the <laughs> other one but but the, yeah, the, I really love the sphere of protection and 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 find its flexibility and, and its utility so fantastic. Uh, so I'm glad it's it's being put out there into the world a lot more because once you, yeah. you get this down, and you can use it for so many things. And it, it's like an American. It invention. really is a very American invention. <laughs> I, Juliet Ashley was probably in Denver, Colorado, when she was working on that. Yeah, and I think the other piece of that, like to compare it to like the LBRP, which I've practiced, I've primarily done the Celtic Golden Dawn version, and I did it for many years, is that, you know, the sphere of protection has this really nice balance. Part of what we sometimes have happen in various esoteric practices is that we have an unbalance of solar energy, which we end up getting in like many of the world religions, right? If you look at something like Christianity, there is all solar and they see the Telluric is essentially evil, right? So yeah. it's always like, you see all these photos of like Jesus with a halo of light or like, you know, the the priest pulling down the solar to like, you know, you, whatever, you know, banish the demons. Mm -hmm. And and that's all they work with is solar, but that creates an unbalance, right? Because that's yeah. not energy that we have in the world and the same with telluric so you you see if to, we can also have telluric currents that get you know if you're only working telluric energy or you're not working the solar energy like that has a whole other set of problems which is probably more detail than we need to go into but by bringing the solar and the telluric together unifying them with sort of the elements of creation we end up with this extremely balanced thing and we can use it for a lot of purposes and it's gentle and balancing and you know and it's been around a long time so it's 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 a nice ritual to to practice and i agree i i don't think i i don't think that i've i've i won't say that i haven't tried i definitely tried using the lp for land healing and i will say that i've used it pretty successfully whenever i've been in a situation where like yeah i'm the fracking well and there's some nasty critters running around that i don't want to deal with like that's a really you know i can i think that's a really nice yeah. example of an L I might I might throw down an LBRP there instead. That's um, true. Well, yeah, it's like, oh, okay, I don't know what the heck you guys are feasting on the land, but I don't want you here. So, you know, mm -hmm. but I mean the SOP, once you practice it, could be used in that, you know, for that kind of like sort of more aggressive protective purposes too. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things with the LBRP is like it's really you're looking at the ritual framework of the Golden Dawn, like there are so many, you have to learn all these other other yeah. rituals to do more like specific things you mm -hmm. know but you can do almost anything with the sop though it's like a little maybe a little not as not quite as powerful but yeah. by build by building it up every day and like by creating these tracks in space with so many other practitioners doing it it does you know there is a lot of power to it and it has I mean, been around a while you know like it's been around a while i mean it's certain i think that part of that is whenever you start learning the, the lbrp it really packs a punch the first time you do it like mm -hmm. you could like, I remember the first time I did it, I was almost like high on magic after I had done it. I was like, whoa, like, yeah. this, right? where I think the SOP is much more subtle, but you know, yeah. I've been practicing, I practice the SOP a lot more than I practice the S the LBRP. And at this point I'm, I, I can pretty much do whatever I want with the SOP. Right. So it does require a bit of an, I would say, if you're just thinking about immediate payoff, BRP is going to, but there's a lot more people over time that have done the LBRP. So the egregore of the LBRP, right? The, the group energy of, of mm -hmm. building that writ, I think is, is stronger, but in the end, you know, I, I think the SOP is much more appropriate for land healing in the various kinds of, you know, protection, moving energy, maybe banishing energy, you know, you can do, and you can do all of it. You could just do the banishing form. I mean, SOP has both the, the traditional SOP has both summoning and banishing together where yeah. LBRP, right? We're talking about the ban goal, right? The problem with banishing is if all you do is banish, eventually you're going to deplete yourself, you know, because you need to be summoning in. So there's a, there's a lot of balance in the SOP that I think is not necessarily present in something like the LBRP. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and this is something that JMG says too, if you're doing the LBRP, you know, after a few months, you should be definitely doing the the middle pillar to be yeah. invoking energy or yeah. doing the invoking a pentagram. Whereas SOP, you don't have to do that. You, it's it's all in one. It's all so well balanced yeah. already. And the other thing I have seen too is like people who are doing the LBRP out in nature can sometimes piss off the local nature spirits because they're banishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're <laughs> disrupting the yeah. the psychic in the sense. environment, the etheric and astral environment that you're in. Mm. Whereas the SOP is just so much more gentle and 
and balancing and that and that may be why it also takes longer for it to like get really powerful but it's one of those things that builds and builds yeah yeah like i would say i mean i i don't know if i can compare myself because i've only done the lbrp about 10 years and i've done sop about 20 so but i would say <laughs> my sop is a lot stronger than my lbrp at this point but i think the other piece that thinking about the history of the sop is that you know we know it's been part of a druid order for at least what like 60 70 years so I mean, yeah. it's been, it's sort of rooted in Druidry. And when people learn the SOP, if you learn the SOP through AODA, you know, usually the first year you learn it, you just sort of learn it, you know, how to do it. But then as you move into sort of your second year of learning it, part of what you do is you connect it like really intimately with your local ecosystem. So like my standard SOP, I call sacred trees. Sometimes I call sacred animals, but usually I call sacred trees. So I call like the black birch in the East. Yeah. I call, you know, I call the, the Eastern cedar in the South, you know, like, so I actually have, so I'm not asking, I'm not sending anything away from nature. I'm calling my allies, you know, oh. in, I call herbs. I have like, I don't know, probably like 15 of them. So, you know, it sort of depends oh. on my mood and, and what I need. But, you know, thinking about that is that you can actually tie all those natural energies, those relationships that you're building, those allies, those, you know, your, your, your healing plants. Like, and you know, I have a fantastic herbal SOP that I do pretty regularly and, you know, it's, it's my, it's my plant allies. It's the medicine that I take every day in my body. Yeah. Cause I also build my, I have like, <laughs> it's a whole other story, but I make these seven using the SOP framework. I make these for my daily herbs. Mm -hmm. I make a seven element blend that represents each of those. And then I take mm -hmm. that. And then when it runs, I make about three months at a time. And when I take that, I, sometimes I shift the herbs in it. So, you know, I've got like, right now, I think I've got, I've always take New England, New England Aster, Reishi, Chaga, Elderberry, because it's winter, you know, you know, you get the idea, right? So I have seven herbs I take, and then I call them like metaphysically into sort of the healing space. So I think there's a lot of opportunity when you're thinking about this, you know, idea of healing, if we're healing with plants, we're healing with our bodies, that we can use that in a really effective way. Yeah, that's, that's so beautiful. Yeah, so you're saying you have 15 different SOPs that you do. Probably, yeah, at this point. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I mean, that, that's that's one of the beautiful things about SOP. It's like, you know, <laughs> the, you if you're doing like the regular Golden Dawn, you just have the, these four archangels, mm -hmm. you, but you can call in all these different pantheons, different sets of, of in, intelligences or mm -hmm. spirits, which is pretty, pretty fantastic too. But it's also, it, you know, I, I, I understand, like, you know, I, I've done, did the Heathen Golden Dawn. I've, you know, I'm, getting deep with like one set is really can be really powerful but having the flexibility to to be able to work yeah that's with, cool yeah with plant allies that's amazing you're yeah. calling in your plant allies like uh, yeah, I really yeah like, up when you said that because that opened up some doors for me i feel like you know i have to write i've actually been meaning to write a, a post on my blog about this because i've been doing this practice for a couple of years now building the seven element blend for myself and then calling with my sop mm -hmm. as like when i need extra healing and extra support and of course these are plants that i cultivate these are plants that i spread you know these are plants that are like i said my you know deep lies that i need for my body like new england aster i have asthma don't have to take any asthma medication medication now because i use aster take that as a plant i take for the rest of my life right so that's a plant that will be you know holding you know well, aster holds my northern quarter because aster is the star right that's the pleiades that's the heavens right so you know thinking about thinking about that you know the those relationships you know like we're kind of off the topic a little bit of what we were started on but i think it's really interesting and i will write about that at some point pretty soon because it has been a really interesting way of thinking about that. But that's what I mean about the SOP being that, you know, as John Michael says, the Swiss army knife, like it's just, you can use it for anything. And apparently you can use it for making incense and herbal blends too. Wow. Yeah. That's so cool. And so like you're, you, there's a different elemental correspondences. So you're corresponding the plant with an element or a direction and a direction. Yeah. How are you making those correspondences? Like, like, so the aster is the North is in the North because it's a, the star. So north <laughs> north is earth, east is air, south is fire, west is water. So Hawthorne always holds the water quarter for me. Okay. West, you know, so it's just sort of, I mean, you. there's lots of ways to do it. I do it. I've been studying magical herbalism and herbalism a long time. So I pretty much, pretty much do it intuitively just based on my knowledge of plants at this point. But, you know, if you were starting out and you weren't sure, you could use astrological correspondences, which might be really helpful thinking about, thinking about, you know, sort of 
we also have them coordinated with seven days, right? So you can yeah. use the day correspondence and map those onto the SOP. You can look at Culpepper's, some of, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, JMG's got a new great book out that has some of that stuff. So you can sort of look at the traditional, I don't, like the, the traditional elemental associations with those, but you can also think about the function. So, yeah. you know, something like spirit within to me um, is not a, is not a physical medicine. Like right now that's wood bent knee for me. That is a metaphysical wood medicine to help me connect with my creativity and my flow. So I'm not using bet, bet knee. I mean, Betany is going to work on me physically, but it's in, but Betany is in the blend because I want that, I, I want that spirit work with Betany. So I'm also choosing where I put, like where I associate the plant with helps me, like mugwort's been in that place for me sometimes, you know, Hawthorne and Elder sometimes have been there, you know, sort of like sometimes I, so, you know, so it's sort of like you, you, you almost, you can build it, you can build it using all of the sort of esoteric knowledge of Western civilization, right? But you could also build it using your own relationships and what you need at the moment and your own understanding of those elements. Right. So what what plant do you want to be working on your spirit within? Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Love it. Yeah. Like Reishi could work pretty well there too. Mm, you know? I think Reishi's been there. I think Reishi right now is in spirit below, but yeah, okay. totally Reishi could totally be there. <laughs> yeah, spirit below makes sense too. Like a mushroom, mushroom yeah. spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trans transmuting the yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's so awesome. Yeah. Well, see, okay, so the reason I have Reishi and Spirit Below is because my primary SOP I call the Great Soil Web and the Mycelial Kingdom when I do Spirit Below and I actually root my fingers into the soil. So yeah. I always have to have a mushroom there because I'm always calling mushroom. I've been calling mushroom there, like mycelium there forever. So from this is again getting into my personal correspondence. So I don't want to put a plant there, although something like comfrey could go really well there, right? Or dandelions yeah. with a deep tap root. I, I want to really root to the mycelial kingdom and the soil web because that's who I call there. So whenever I'm making medicine, I'm going to put that plant or that mushroom there because that's where I'm, you know, that's where I'm, where I'm thinking about it. So I guess the more we talk about it, because I haven't written about this yet, the, the, I think it is more intuitive for me, but I could, but I mean, you could do it in a number of different ways. Yeah. And it's yeah. a personal practice. And so it it matters, you know, how you associate it personally. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. That, that, that's one of the cool things is like how personal you can get with that. Cause that, that is like you, you have the tracks and space of the larger framework of the ritual, mm -hmm. but then you can get very deeply personal with mm -hmm. the, the particulars mm -hmm. about it, but you're still using the same um, symbols in the sign. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 So you still, you still are connecting to that energy of the ritual as a living being, right. And that, and the tracks and space and all those things. Um, and you're connecting with everybody else who might be doing it. So we're all building that, but it's also deeply, deeply personal. And I would argue deeply connected to your local ecosystem for most people, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. so it's, I'm, I'm calling the medicine that exists or the trees or the animals or whatever, whatever I choose to call, I'm calling those beings that live on my land specifically where I literally that I walk out my door and there they are. So those are my allies. And those are the folks that I want to build a relationship with, but you know, I'm an, I'm an animist. So, you know, if somebody was a polytheist, they might be calling their gods in each of those quarters, you know, or their honored dead or their ancestors. So, you know, you don't, I'm just, I'm talking like an animist now, but you could do, you know, you're a Christian Druid you call the, you call the archangels, you know, yeah. you call Jesus in the center, you know, you call yeah. the Holy Trinity for those three. So there's so many opportunities people to to do that and you know that's i think part of it but that's now you're starting to see why i chose sop for land healing right yeah, totally. <laughs> right <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i think this was very on topic anyway yeah, <laughs> yeah it totally was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah so do you have any other things that you want to share about land healing in general because i want to ask you about your art as well oh Let's sure i think we probably i mean we that's the things I brought to share. So I think the only thing I would say about land healing is I do just want to talk about it as sort of a spiritual path for a moment. Yeah. Because, you know, that's sort of one of the, the I guess, I mean, really the impetus for writing the book. And, and to be clear, I'm not going to make a single penny on this book. I'm donating every penny of this book because these are teachings the land gave me. And I did this book in service. And so I am actually taking every single bit of profit that I make from this book and I'm donating it to conservation organizations, including the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy and the United Plant Savers. And so I'm not, you know, so I'm not, I'm here to spread the word. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, and I think that's important because this is like my core spiritual practice. So thinking about land healing as a spiritual practice, I think is a really useful way for people that are 
saying, oh, I want to do something. And it really does. One of the things I will say, I think the most important thing for me that I've learned over time is that that idea of that reciprocal like healing relationship that you get. But also when you start working with the spirits of your land and you're doing any kind of earth-based spirituality or any kind of neo-paganism, you develop an incredibly deep connection because, you know, if you think about the typical, you know, earth-based spiritual person or pagans, like I'm going to go out and do a cool ritual in the woods. They go out, do the ritual. Maybe they pick up some garbage and they go back to their house and go about their lives, right? Mm -hmm. You start doing this land healing work and suddenly you're in a much deeper connection over time. So when you need something, you've got a lot more energy that you can pull. You've got a lot more allies that are there. You've got people that you've been there for, and now they're there for you. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for me to articulate that and put it into words, but it's like, if you want to really build your relationship and, and your ability to do things in the world, this is a, and you want to work with nature and magically, or you want to work with nature as an herbalist, adding a set of practices is really, it can be a really good path to getting connections. And, you know, it's good to just feel like a good human being. So I think that's the only other thing I'd like to share. Yeah, that that's super important to think about. And yeah, I definitely have found found that like building those relationships, the deeper that you go, the more reciprocal energy that that you get, you know, and it's very powerful. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think part of land healing and healing ourselves is beauty and creating beauty. And you have, you know, developed this amazing artistic ability and, and artistic style with your various modes of, of art. And I just love your paintings and the things that you're creating. And are we in your artist studio right now? You are in my studio. Well, yes. you're in my studio slash magical space there. And so let me yeah. get out of the way for a moment. So oh, there's no. my... That's my Awen altar. That's like my sacred creativity altar where I have working like active projects going. And then that's one of my, that's my primary working altar. And then I've got one that you can't see back there. There's different elemental altars. Ooh. Actually, there's one. There's, I think, seven, seven altars. And I have a, I have a sacred bathroom that's like behind and mm -hmm. I, and I have a bathtub. I did all this mosaic on, and that's like, you know, a place where I do actually a lot of ceremony in there and a lot of healing in there. And there's another altar or two in there. So yeah, you're actually in my art studio slash magical space, which to me, I do not distinguish between those two, you know, as a druid, I don't have to so, you know, exactly. creativity and, you know, we chant all ceremony you know, awen is for druids is the is is divine inspiration or divine you know, in, you know creativity from the divine whatever that means so those things are not separate to me mm, totally yeah. yeah so it's really exciting to see your space so thank you for <laughs> hearing that with us and i'm just curious if there's anything that you've created recently new that you're really thrilled about or if you want to just share a little bit about your art in general and where you're at yeah. with your art journey yeah, sure. So I would say I do have some projects I'm not quite ready to share about, but stay mm -hmm. tuned to the end of 2020. I've been working on different uh, tarot and oracle decks, but I'm not really talking about it because because of AI and all these, like, there's like so many like new challenges. Normally I would just like create these decks and share them, mm -hmm. but I've found that because of, because of the challenges with AI, I don't want to share my ideas till I'm ready to publish them. Mm -hmm. And also there's a lot of counterfeiting happening right now. So I'm sort of a little bit more guarded about sort of these longer term projects that take me a, a deck or a book typically takes me four or five years to do. And I'm usually working on like, so I'm working on two right now. One of them's got an astrological kind of theme, which is cool. And one of them's got oh. kind of a mushroomy theme, but that's all I'll say about those. Please. But I would say like in general, a lot of what I've been exploring, you know, it's interesting because we talk a lot about sacred creativity in the Druid tradition, but there are not actually good theories about it. You know, like it's a nice thing we do, but you know, and so it's, what's really fascinating is that I'm a learning researcher and a writing professor. And I'm actually doing all of this research now on flow states uh, oh, because wow. I'm like, oh, this is the thing that we do in Druidry. And I've been really experimenting a lot with like, how do I get into flow and what happens when I get into flow? And, you know, what if I have some wood betony before or mugwort before I, so working on sort of deepening the understand, like my understanding and my magical theory about cre sacred creativity, which has been a really interesting thing. And I, I think it's a project that I'm Eventually, I'm going to write about it. I'm slowly starting to play around with it. But right now, it's just really a practice in the studio and thinking about like, how do you in, in how do you bring magic into being through painting? Mm. And I would say the other thing, and maybe I can share with you, I could share with you a few things. There's some things over here. 
I did like this is a tarot deck for a friend who's a tarot card for a friend, which has got the SOP look. He's wow. uh, he's working on yeah. this is my this is for my friend from Dragonfire Meadery, Derek. He's he's got all of his different bottles of, of meat all have dragons, and eventually he's gonna put a deck out. And this is one I worked on for gorgeous finished for him. So there's a couple of things here. Let's see what's this. Oh, here's something cool. This is a uh, 12 fold elemental wheel I developed. I'm going to put that on my blog soon. And it's just so people can fill it out and yeah. they can, you know, and they can use that because it's 12 fold. So they could use it astrologically or they could use it. I find that I don't think I have eight seasons I, or eight, eight seasons. I think I have 12. So sort of the beginning, middle, end of spring, beginning, oh, middle, right. end of summer. So, you Good know, point. those are some things I'm working on, but I've been, I've been really thinking about, I've been really delving deeply into this idea of what is sacred creativity and yeah. how to practice it. How do we develop? So that's my awe and altar where I'm doing like magical work and then painting and then, and, and I'm really struggling with that with social media because so much of it's video content now and they like want me to record my process. And I'm like, I'm in the middle of sacred ceremony when I'm painting. Like I'm not gonna, or when I'm doing leather work, like I'm not gonna do that. So I don't know. I guess people on Instagram don't mind my pictures, but you know, but really thinking about that and thinking about like, especially in the age of AI, right? So we have, I mean, we've got so many challenges and and what what I've really been thinking about and starting to write about is, but like sacred creativity and creativity is like our birthright. And it's not even about the things we produce. It's right. about the experience that we have and the connection that we have to this flow of Awen, right? To this inspiration. And how is that like a magical practice in and of itself where I say to the land, hey, what message would you like me to bring into the world? Or I say to Rosemary or, you know, whatever, whatever one of my friends, my herb friends, would you like me to paint you? What would you like me to depict? And what would what energy do you want me to bring forward? And and really just thinking about that, I started thinking about that in a really intentional way when I was painting the plant spirit oracle, but I've sort of taken it many, many steps further now. So I think that's a, you know, and I think it's because of AI, it's because uh, there's all these challenges now to who is a creator and what does that look like? And can we just, you know, tell a computer to pump out something? And yeah, maybe in the end, you know, you get your book cover, but you know, you're not getting anything. So I've been sort of really, I don't know, I've, I've had all the feels about it. And now I'm like beyond the feels and I'm beyond being angry or sad. And now I'm just like, okay, let me actually dig into what this means. And maybe I'll, you know, I'll keep writing about it on my blog and maybe someday I'll, I'll produce a book on it. So that's one of the things I've been thinking about sort of as an artist, but I don't think that this is like disconnected from all these other things. You know, it's like, what we're really talking about is living in an age of disconnection and, you know, this idea of, you know, you just snap your fingers and you can produce a whole book or a whole text, but like at what cost and is it any good? And, you know, so I think that, I think we're going to continue to have a lot of these conversations about some of these, some of these things, but in the meantime, I'm just in my studio sort of working it out in my own head and producing some cool paintings in the, in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's just such a crucial thing too. It's like, it's about the process mm -hmm. of connecting with inspiration, you know, and that, and that's why it's like, you're connected when you're creating. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah, why the right. process is so much more important than, you know, the product. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm thankful that I have products that come out of my inspiration, right. but yeah. I think that's actually how I resolved my, you know, cause as an artist, I had thousands of my pieces of art stolen. And then like every piece of art I've done for most other, like I do a lot of free art for the Druid community or, you know, herb gatherings, they need a logo. They write to me. I'm like, sure, I'll make you a logo, you know, cause I, I, I have a job. I don't, I don't really see myself as a professional artist as much as I do sort of just like I'm in service to my community. And I was really down about how much had been stolen, you know? Yeah. And I kind of had this like block, but then I realized like actually none of this matters because what matters is the the act of creation, the act of connecting to the divine, of connecting to the spirits of nature and saying, what would you like to bring forth? And as soon as I realized that that, like I was thinking, you know, I, if I if I stop thinking about it as a product and start thinking about it as a process and just oh. remember that the product is cool and maybe people want to see it, but that's not why I'm doing it. That has really helped me sort of come through some of the, big AI stuff that, you know, so many artists are dealing with. That's really good to hear that you're, you've come around. Cause I think we had some conversations offline, like about AI when it was first starting to come out and you're realizing all this, this stolen art and yeah. anger. But yeah, I think the way you've like reframed your thought process around it of like, 
being the process of that being what's important rather than the product. I think that is a healthy way of looking at it. Yeah. And then there's still all the, all this products of AI that are <laughs> like clogging <laughs> up, up Amazon with, with bad foraging guides. And Oh man. Yeah. Have you, I don't know if you've seen Sam, Sam Thayer has yeah. been on real. Yes. I'm like, go yeah, Sam. Yeah. And actually I think there are going to be some, it's going to be interesting to see is I think there's a lot of artists and writers that are starting to band together to write representatives and be like, Hey, this is really worse than you think it is. You know, yeah. how many people are going to die of, of eating mums out of an AI from book before you realize you know it means something i write a book on foraging it better be right because if it's not i'm gonna get sued you know so exactly yeah who thinking about well, that that's true. yeah like that it's it's that's like really dangerous and can can kill people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. who's to blame you know that if the publisher can whoever <laughs> just like having their ai do it i don't know yeah. it i hopefully that that can get some traction and, and actually have some some mm -hmm repercussions for the that whole industry yeah. but the other part of this that i've been really thinking about you know and i just actually wrote a, about this on my blog a couple i don't know like a month or two ago is with regards to like all this ai stuff like i think i wrote around around christmas maybe yule is like <laughs> there's magic involved like i make magical art mm -hmm. i open up a sacred space mm -hmm. I work directly with the spirits of nature. If I'm painting something, I'm not just painting, like I'm 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 actually actively doing magic. So if you, you know, get one of my decks or one of my paintings, you know, where you're doing your meditation, you know, I have actually created something that now exists like a gateway, right? So you look at my painting of witch hazel, you want to work with witch hazel, you can use my painting as a gateway to work with witch hazel. But like, what would you get if you did that with AI? <laughs> like so, so there's sort of like you know there are all these like decks and things that are now and i'm like people are nuts i would never touch any of this stuff because what spirits are you connecting with i know that's a good point how's it gonna work <laughs> so i think that's part of it that's for me i'm like well i'm just gonna keep doing what i'm doing and you know create these things but i'm also sort of like yeah i think that maybe they look beautiful you know they look cool but are they actual magical tools or and if they are what are you connecting to? Yeah, what 14 fingered person are you connecting to? Right. right? <laughs> so I've yeah. kind of been thinking about some of those things. I don't know. I have lots of thoughts. I don't know. Ask me again in a year. Maybe I'll have yeah. more to say. Well, I, yeah. I think one of the things though that is helpful too is it's it's it, it is it's like the people who are creating really authentic and creative and original things and like you're you're creating magical tools, you know. Mm -hmm like that's going to be that's more has more value now that's true yeah whereas like people who are just like putting out you know filler yeah. all the time yeah. now they're competing with ai <laughs> you know yeah but people yeah. who are putting out real genuine like original creative magical yeah work um yeah. it's like that's even more valuable now yeah yeah i think that's right and i think people are starting to really understand that you know yeah. as time passes you know, that, you know, there is something to understanding who has created those things. And I don't know if I want to buy anything post 2023, because I don't know how it was created unless it's somebody that I know that I trust. Right. So it's, it's sort of this really interesting time and space for, you know, books and decks and those sorts of things. And I think it'll be interesting to see where things happen, but maybe there will be this sort of, I think there is starting to be this sort of movement saying, actually, no, we value humanity and the creations that they, that they make. Right. That's something that's important to us, you know? So, yeah. So I guess like art, it's kind of complicated right now, but also, <laughs> you know, honestly, like the most of the, 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 just sort of working out the magical pieces and developing the magical theory surrounding sacred creation to me has been really, really a good way to channel some of my frustration about all of these things and not shut me down, which is that's sort great. of like what's happened. And, and I knew a number of artists that have just thrown in the towel and I'm like, no, please don't do that. Like, you know, musicians that are just releasing their whole library for free and things like that because of all of this. So, yeah. you know, I'd say support your creators, tell them you love yeah. them. You know? So do you have anything coming up that you're excited about that you want to share with our, our audience? Yeah. So one of the things I can mention is that I'll be starting an herb school this year with my sister, Brielle Beatty. We have, we've both been doing herbal education and plant walks and everything, which I was mentioning earlier in our talk for 
oh, years, <laughs> years and years, 10 years, you know, and we're bringing all those things together. We don't have any kind of, other than the two of us, we don't have any kind of local herbal education really anywhere in the state anymore. And so we're really focusing on community-based herbalism, holistic herbalism, really thinking about the mind-body-spirit connection. And my sister, Brielle, she trained with Seven Song and I trained with Jim McDonald. And she's also got a lot of, I've got sort of the spirit piece. And then she's got a lot of the body piece. She's an Iyengar yoga teacher. She's a Reiki master. So we're going to sort of bring some of those pieces in as well. And then just pretty much keep doing what we're doing, but under a, a, a better umbrella and offer some certificate options for people. And part of the other thing we've I've been working on is the Hawthorne Botanical Gathering, which is in state college near State College in early June. So if people are in the region and they want to check that out, I'm actually offering the pre-conference or the, like the Friday night workshop, which is on gardening. And we're going to have seeds, like some of these seeds I was showing that workshop. And we're going to be able to help people plan their refugia and think about it. So those are some things coming up. Exciting. Awesome. I'm so happy to hear about another herb school popping up in Western PA. That's great. Yeah. The Western PA definitely needs one. Yeah. <laughs> Tell, you're telling me. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dana. I really appreciate the heck out of you and all of your work. And this has been really fun chatting with you. If folks want to learn more about getting your book, which comes out March 28th, 2024. So like a month from now, published by Red Feather direct people, where should they go online to find you? Um, everybody can go to my website, thedruidsgarden.com. I have the books there. The blog is there. There's links to Instagram and my art. So, you know, you, and you can find it at any major bookseller. I would say what really helps is if you go to your local bookstores and request it there, that actually makes a big difference for rather than say buying it on Amazon. Primarily, it you know, it, it, helps, the, it helps the publishers a lot too, and it helps your local mm -hmm. bookstore. So go to your local bookstore, ask for it. You know, they're probably getting a Red Feather catalog already because Red Feather produces a ton of different metaphysical books but yeah that's how you can get it you can find out from my website heck yeah awesome well thank you again dana and enjoy the rest of your day enjoy the maple sugaring next weekend thank you and thanks again for being here cheers